Hey, welcome to The Perspective today. We have a great program because Dr. Andrew Blackwood is with us again, and we're completing a six-week series. Been in here once a week. Andrew, glad you're here. <laughs> Good to be here. And uh, we're doing this whole thing on parents, eh? Well, I'm seeing you the questions you've just been working through. It's been amazing. Uh, how to be brave parents. Did I get it right this time? Well, close. It takes brave parents to raise brave children, so we're helping them be brave. <laughs> we want to talk a little bit today about unaddressed anxiety. Yes. And before we get into the subject, I just want to say to each of you as you're watching today, that there's a toll-free number that you can call at any time. Whether it's to do with parenting or just your own journey, we want you to know that we're here to pray with you, to encourage you. Don't be living in isolation. I think my friend Jonathan Lewis, who is often on the program with Fathers for Fathers, makes mention of the fact that as guys, we do life in isolation, and that's not a healthy thing. And neither is it when it comes to parenting. We don't want to admit that we've messed up or that we've made huge blunders. And oftentimes, we're just repeating what happened to us as kids. And so, Andrew, I'm going to come to you today, and we've got some interesting questions to unpack. But I think what I just said actually speaks to a sense of heightened anxiety that we often have. Right. But what are some of the biggest impacts of unaddressed anxiety? Yeah. Un unaddressed anxiety quite often unfolds as a poor sense of self, a low sense of esteem, an impoverished identity. There's a whole program of that, isn't there? It is. It is. A couple of things. What, what causes that? Low self-esteem. Well, a lot of the times we base our sense of self and identity on accomplishments, uh, things that we have the capacity to do. And quite often, when we fear that we can't do, in keeping with our conversation from week five, we feel incompetent, we feel powerless, we feel insignificant, and we feel unsafe. It causes us to feel anxious. So when we feel anxious and we imagine ourselves because remember anxiety is a picture of the future that is negative when we see ourselves failing and we see people rejecting us we break down on the inside and over time we build these ideas about ourselves that just aren't true that i am not worthwhile i am unimportant i am damaged goods nobody will love me all these ideas about ourselves and our identity they flow out of feeling anxious. Sometimes when I watch parents, never me, of course, <laughs> you know, when I'm saying that, I'm talking about me, it's like, why don't they smarten up? You know, why can't they learn it? And it seems that parents repeat and repeat the same thing. Maybe like they're trying to drive a square peg into a round hole. Yeah. Can you explain that? Well, it's funny because quite often when our children are feeling anxious, it causes us to feel anxious. And those same things that they worry about, we worry about. It's just the adult version. You mentioned, you know, like, I, I don't want to screw up my kid. I don't want to mess up my kid. Guess what that is? That's anxiety. <laughs> You're picturing your child's life messed up because of you. And as opposed to taking that to God and really dialing it back and figuring out what's going on, we try to take control and then we act in ways that work against the very thing that we want. I'm going to borrow your phrase, let's take it to God. And if we go to God, is a healthy self-esteem in line with scripture? And maybe talk about humility, because I thought I'm supposed to be humble, not, well, look at me, I'm the expert in parody. <laughs> right. So a lot of people, <laughs> whether we're talking about parents or we're talking about young people who grow up in church, there is a fear of becoming proud and cocky and conceited. But there's a difference between being confident and being cocky. The scriptures tell us to be aware and to agree with God that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. The scriptures tell us to be courageous, be of good, be of good courage. That's what God wants us to do and experience in him, through him, for him. However, if we are so concerned and worried about our performance or worried about us being caught up in ourselves, 
and we we play small. We give room to the enemy to sow those seeds of thought about ourselves over and over and over. And then we see the fruit of that. People are inactive in their faith. But still yet we have these unpleasant feelings that we then try to push under, push, you push it under, sweep it under the rug. But it doesn't stay there. We address them. We cope and we do all these things that aren't helpful. Okay, let's go to the other side. As a parent, how am I going to contribute to my son or daughter's healthy self-esteem? I mean, I often hear parents talk up their kids, and you think at the age of six, they're you know they're a brain surgeon. I mean, the things they're going to accomplish, and maybe caught talk about that line: "You can do whatever you want." Okay, I went to my granddaughter's graduation. I didn't know they had graduation for pre-kindergarten. Yes. Like that was, <laughs> I mean, I love her and then she needed the graduation, but the rest of us just kind of, and look at it. And the things they were talking about, what these kids were going to accomplish, and I'm scratching my head. How do I contribute to my kids' healthy self-esteem without promising them something totally ludicrous? Right. So there, there are many that things. It made me feel better. Just it made, it made yeah. you feel better. Yeah. Yeah, to, to, to think how ludicrous it is to say that you can be anything and you can do anything you want to do. I think the intention is to really encourage and affirm them. And of course, we're biased because we love our kids. We love our grandkids. Uh, but, you know, the scripture tells us we can do all things through Christ. So we're just a little bit off the mark when we say that they can do any and everything that they want to do. Uh, what we want to do is really highlight, yes, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We definitely want to acknowledge how God has made this child and say, you know what? Yeah, I can see you doing this. I can imagine you doing this. But we want to come back to highlighting the value of the person, not of the behavior, not of the role. Because sometimes we can invest, we, we can invest in a role more than we are investing in that child. I'll use myself, for example. Yeah. As a child, I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a pediatrician, in fact, because I loved my pediatrician. He was great and everybody loved him. And even at a young age, I could see that there was a level of respect. And there was this mantra that my dad had, education is the way out. So if you become educated, you will get a good job, you'll have a good income, and you won't be poor. That's a bit of pressure even in itself. That of shape. course. And this is part of our socialization. This is how we learn about life. So I'm going through life and I'm like, yes, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a doctor. And then I feel chemistry. <laughs> oh, I remember that. Right. I failed chemistry and I, wa I was instantly depressed. I went back and took chemistry at night school. See, there's along with calculus, but there's a good degree of health. In the fact that you did that, I was still depressed when it was all. <laughs> I just squeaked by. That this is not my calling, right? It would have helped so much if somebody came and said, "Mike, you're not wired for that." Precisely, really. And and again, that's the insight that we as parents get to have. We get to look at the traits of our children to say that you know I see this in you. This is great. You have the capacity for this. And, and that's one aspect that we want to really affirm in our children. We want to affirm the traits uh, more than we do want to affirm the exhibition of particular behaviors or the ex ex exhibition of, you know, great performance in roles. Because when their esteem is attached to performance, what happens when they have a bad performance day? <laughs> right? You feel, and that was my life. That was the way I lived in my head. But isn't that part of life? I mean, we're not going to get eight buses every time. Yes, I, I agree. So being able to handle that without losing your sense of self and sense of value is important. People who tend to feel anxiety, they think a lot in all or nothing terms, which is how I did. So when I failed chemistry, I concluded it's because I wasn't smart. I wasn't smart enough. And people who are smart enough don't fail. So I failed, so I am a failure. And you're really going down the hill there, aren't you? That's where our children live. Children who feel anxious, these are the kinds of thoughts that play through it's their mind. Perfect. Exactly. So what we want to do is understand that on the one hand, but on the other hand, 
We want to make use of daily opportunities to affirm who they are, not just what they can do. We're going to hold that thought. We're going to be right back. You're watching The Perspective today with uh, Coach Drew, Dr. Andrew Blackwood. And at any time you'd like someone to talk to or pray with, call that number on the screen below. Stay with us. I'll be right back. Hey, welcome back to The Perspective with uh, Coach Drew right now. And Andrew, your website is coachdrew.ca. That's right. A lot of resources there, and uh, including how to get a hold of your book, The Art of a Genuine Apology. Yes, that's a brilliant book. And uh, now we're putting together this whole thing on parenting and being brave parents so that our kids can be brave because, man, it is a tough world out there. Whoa. A lot harder than when I was growing up. Yes. Yeah. There are a lot of concerning things that our children are contending with. That's why we want our homes to be places of peace. We want to parent in peace. So, before, yeah. And so, just before I we went to the break, though, as we're building off of that parenting in peace, we were talking a lot about self esteem. Never asked you the question, you know, the low ball one. What on earth is self esteem? And, uh, Talk to me from the, the level, let's pick it up, of a teenager. Okay. So, signs of a healthy sense of self, okay, which is what esteem is. Esteem is your sense of self-worth and self-value. A healthy teen is going to be able to handle constructive criticism. They're going to be able to handle standing alone not going along with everyone and everything just because they want to belong. They have a sense of belonging. They know who they are. They know what they stand for. A, he a healthy self-esteem enables people to be assertive, not aggressive or passive by default. Aggressive, like you're all uh, getting in people's faces or they're like, oh, sure, you can do whatever you want. I'm okay. No, being clear, being direct, being open, being honest, being respectful. All these are signs of a healthy sense of esteem. I think maybe you should do a chapter on parenting with candy bars. I think that's called bribery, isn't it? <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, the old adage, if it works, do it. That's going to backfire, right? It does. It does, especially for children who are dealing with anxiety, because not everyone who is experiencing anxiety shows it or even knows it. A lot of the people who find themselves feeling depressed, it actually starts with anxiety. That's where I found myself as a teen. I was anxious and I didn't think I would be able to support myself as an adult because I failed chemistry and I became depressed. I didn't know where my life would go. And I didn't know what to do. And the, that way of thinking wasn't new. I was thinking that way as a child when I was like, oh my God, I can't make a mistake. I have to be perfect. I need to do this. That just grew. Into, and it didn't end when I, was, when I left high school. It continued on to university. There are so many parents that I meet whose children are thinking about ending their lives. They're in university. They've done well. They're... They are high achievers, but yet their sense of self is so low. Their sense of hope for life is virtually non-existent because of anxiety. It's this all or nothing thinking. It's this patterned way of thinking. And we don't know as parents that we can actually be reinforcing this with our language by telling them, you need to do this. You have to do this. You should do this. We were trying to be supportive, but unwittingly, we're actually cutting them down on the inside. Okay, time out. I think we got to go back and ask something, at least in my mind. And I'm going to use you as the example. Well, please use yourself. You talked about with your parents, and when you were growing up, you had these 
you struggle with self-esteem because of the huge expectations. If your parents could have only heard your lecture today, what would you have want? What would you have wanted them to do differently? How could they have helped you? So there's a difference between a desire and an expectation. Explain. We desire for our children to be the best that they can be, to to reach for the stars and then land among, you know, re, what is it? Reach for the moon. And if you miss, you land among the stars. That's what we want for them. And there's nothing wrong with desiring that. However, when it becomes an expectation, it can become unhealthy when they have to, when there's all this pressure where they're, uh, the expectations are unrealistic or they're, they're not actually fair for that person or their stage of development or all the things that are going on in their lives. So I think what I and so many people that I work with would want my parents to have done differently was actually learned the signs, learned the language that I would be using, that they're using, that are reinforcing anxiety and nobody knew. It was never about their intentions. We tend to focus a lot on intentions, but really what we want to pay attention to is the impact. Yeah, nobody gave me the course on how to be a good parent and what to watch out for. When you said if they could only have observed the signs that you were exhibiting, uh, we've talked about this previously, but just rhyme off some of the, the standard signs so that if a parent or a grandparent is watching right now uh, their antenna is going to go up. Right. Well, a lot of the times when we look at our kids, we see signs and we don't really know what they mean. So uh, someone who's withdrawn, someone who's hesitant, someone who is visibly shaken or nervous, those are signs that, okay, they're thinking something. Some people are just not as comfortable in large groups. They might be introverted, but being introverted doesn't necessarily mean that you're afraid. So we want to pay attention to signs like that. Mm. But then there are signs like hyperactivity. I know we ADD and ADHD are big terms that we kind of want to diagnose in kids, but quite often children are dysregulated because there's so much anxiety, there's so much uncertainty. So hyperactive behavior, even aggressive behavior, overeating, undereating, all of these things can be signs of anxiety. But one of the telltale signs, especially in those kids who are very expressive, is the language. When they say, I can't, I never, I always, I have to, pay attention to that. So let me build off of that. That's the language of the children. What should be the language of the parents? We've got about 30 seconds. Just talk to me about what are some things that I can say as a grandfather but also to my adult kids as well, to affirm them. Certainly. So there are a couple things. This is why it's beneficial for people to connect. There are so many things that we can do. One, I teach people how to use an exercise I call deep appreciation. This is where you affirm the person in front of you. You look beyond the behavior to see the traits. You want to label the traits. You want to let them know, you know what? I see how God made you. He made you loving. I see that when you hug your sister, when you meet me at the door after school, I love the way God made you. I love that about you. When you say that, it goes to a deep place in those children. Right. And it matters. It matters. So that's one thing I think it's important to learn how to do. And the other is learn positive motivational language. Is as opposed to telling your children that they need to, they have to, they should. There's a different way to motivate them with the words that you use. So good. Coach Drew, I want to thank you. Thank you for pouring your heart into this subject. People can get your material at coachdrew.ca. It's fantastic. Uh, you've motivated me to be better in what I'm doing. I just want to say thank oh, you. My pleasure. Thank you, Mike. Stay with us here on The Perspective. I'll be right back in just a moment. Hi, my name is Ryan Walter, and I played a long time in the National Hockey League. Uh, so long ago, I played against the Philadelphia Flyers back in the day when they were the Broad Street Bullies. Uh, let's talk about fear. <laughs> we, we had some fear. You couldn't be alive and not be afraid in that situation. But you know what's interesting is uh, Napoleon says there's two great levers to move men, 
fear and interest. But you know what Jesus says? This is crazy. He says, fear not, right? 365 times in the Bible, apparently, it says, fear not. So this week, let's not fear. Let's believe in Jesus. You know, one of the things that's integral to every day is the reality that you and I have to make choices. We have to make choices about so many things. Sometimes they're little things, sometimes they're big things. And sometimes we can just be overwhelmed with making those difficult decisions and wondering what path they're going to take us down. Well, today, as we're getting towards the end of the book of Colossians, we're going to talk about some of the choices that uh, the Apostle Paul talked about that as God's followers, we need to make. And the first choice is I need to think about the reality that I have a choice in the path that I take. And especially when we think about the path that we're taking, but how we perceive life, how we look at life, and how we choose to press on. Yesterday, I met with a gentleman who was dealing with a lot of very challenging things. He had a workplace accident, and uh, that had left him severely incapacitated to hold down a regular job. And he talked about how he approached that, how he was dealing with all the different bureaucracies as he tried to get some kind of financial compensation. I was intrigued, though, with how he had chosen to handle those very difficult ups and downs. And so Paul comes and he says in Colossians chapter 3 uh, and verse 10, he said, you need to put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator, which is the Lord himself. And then he says in verse 12, put on as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, and bearing with one another and forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Now, when I read that list of things that God says, I'm to clothe myself with, that's a choice that I have to make. My goodness, I would like everyone to put on, you know, patience and, um, and kindness and humility and a, a level of tolerance for one another. Can you imagine if everybody you met was like that? Well, folks, it starts with you. But here are the things that keep us from doing that, from becoming the people that we would like to be surrounded with. You have to be that person yourself. And one of the first things that, they're kind of like three toxins that I want to suggest today that we strongly need to avoid. And what is this sense of entitlement? If you go through life for that sense of entitlement that says, I deserve it and I expect it, um, guess what? We're going to feed a generation that often are not prepared to do the hard work to make relationships work. We want everybody coming at us in the way that we want. Make me feel comfortable. It's all your fault. Hey, folks, you got to own your own stuff. And then another toxin that we need to avoid is the whole thing of selfishness. It's a big factor in our toxicity. And uh, this is different than our sense of entitlement. This is all about, you know, what I need to do to make me happy. And it brings about a huge sense of indifference in our approach to life. There are so many uh, evaluations being done on various age groups and what they think about themselves, what they think other people should give to them, and their indifference to life. But hey, guess what? Selfishness needs to be booted out the door. And Paul talks about that. You can't be selfish and clothe yourself with kindness, meekness, humility. And then he goes on, he says, let the peace of Christ um, rule in your heart, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. So you see, the peace of God does not, if it does not rule our lives, then we're going to really be in pieces. We all want peace, but few of us are prepared to follow and to allow God's rule to be the guide in our life. And so how are we going to live? Well, Paul says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. What does that look like? I think the example that we need to draw from is Jesus himself. When he was going to the cross, uh, can you imagine the emotional turmoil? I can't fully enter into it. But he said, Lord, if you're willing, take this cup from me. And the cup was reading the prospect of the cross. And then he said, yet not my will, but yours be done. 
if I'm going to live with God's peace, if I'm going to get rid of a sense of entitlement and kick selfishness out the door, to be the kind of person that Paul is talking about, I need more than anything else to make a choice, to let Jesus be the leader and Lord of my life, believe that he'll guide me in the way that I need to go, and to know that I can trust in him. It's all about who we choose to trust. Let's decide wisely the choice we're going to go down, the path we're going to go down today. My name is Alan Gallant, the Executive Director of Agora Network Ministry. My wife and I had the privilege of writing a book called The Beautiful Strokes of God. This book is to encourage anyone that has gone through in the local church, a mental health crisis. So if you're needing to read some good material on mental health and healing and the church, reach out to Agora Network Ministries and we can provide this book for you. You know, as we think about the choices that we make, it keeps coming back to the daily disciplines that we bring into our life. You know, if you decide that you want to lose some weight, well, you're going to have to regulate your diet and, and maybe increase your exercise. You get that. You understand that. But if I'm going to also think about how I want to live, I need to take what I've just been sharing with you to heart and saying, Jesus, I need your help. I need your strength. Every day there are things that want to rob me of my patience, things that can get under my skin. I'm just like you. We're all the same. We deal with the same stuff. It might be different uh, situations, but all those things that can impact who we are and how we come across in life. So I want to put on daily the nature of Jesus in my life. And how do I do that? It's very simple. I need to first and foremost say, Lord, I want you to be my leader. I want you to be my savior. I want you to be the one in control of my life. And when I make that decision, then I open myself up to say, God, will you live through me? Will you love through me today? And you'll be amazed at the difference that will begin to happen that people will notice in your life because you're putting on the new nature of Christ. If we can help you at any time, Call us at 855-910-6297. We'd love to hear from you.